Welcome to Hot Issues, brought to you by Gaza, the nation's builder. This week, we are taking a look at the Supreme Court decision on the voter registration exercise, on the voters register generally, and how we understand it. Why did the plaintiffs go to court? Why their reliefs granted? How would this affect the future of elections in Ghana and so on? Welcome to Hot Issues. And uh, we are very, very privileged to have with us one of the lawyers in the case. Very prominent lawyer, very articulate. We're going to be talking to Nana Asante Bedietu, and we're going to seek clarification on all the issues which are being raised, you know, in the public domain. So you're welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kosi. Why did your plaintiffs go to court? Thank you. Um, in 2014, um, following the election petition case, my clients approached me uh, on the issue of the use of the NHIS card to register and uh, to seek my advice about it. And I said, well, I mean, looking at it, the, uh, the use of the card did not comply with the Constitution. And therefore, it should not be one of the things that we use uh, to register. And because the Constitution says that you must be a Ghanaian, you must be 18 years of age and above, and of sound mind. And since the National Health Insurance Card didn't tell us what your nationality mm -hmm. was, it wouldn't qualify for a person to use it to establish that they are eligible to register. And so they asked that we go to court to seek uh, interpretation from the Supreme Court and enforced the Article 42 of the Constitution. We went to court and uh, uh, the Electoral Commission and the Attorney General both argued that um, it was the list of identification documents in CI 72 had nothing to do with qualification but identification. Mm -hmm. um, and the court did not accept that because, in fact, even the heading of the section was qualification to register. It clearly showed that what you wanted to do was to be able to... Uh, <coughs> and then one of the ways in which you could register if you didn't have an ID card um, was to have two persons who were already registered mm -hmm. to guarantee that you qualify. So looking at that form as well, it was clear that those documents were meant to establish qualification. Mm -hmm. The court found that uh, out of all the other documents, the passport, the driving license, the national ID card, and uh, an existing voter ID card, the national health insurance card did not uh, assist in establishing your qualification. Therefore, its use was unconstitutional. Following that judgment, we wrote to the Electoral Commission mm -hmm. um, to <coughs> find out what steps they were taking in view of what the court had said. because. In constitutional law, when the court declares something to be unconstitutional, null and void, and of no legal effect, it is retrospective. Now, I want to clarify something because it, in the Constitution, there is a provision that says that the, there cannot be any retrospective application of the law. Mm -hmm. um, that really relates to positive law, law that has been passed by Parliament or some other lawmaking constitutional body mm -hmm. like the electoral commission mm -hmm. or, or any other body that can f uh, uh, put into play constitutional instruments so that today if sitting in front of tv3 studios uh, you can smoke a cigarette and tomorrow parliament passes a law that outlaws that you cannot be arrested by the police because the day before when it was not law mm -hmm. you were doing that that is the retrospective or retroactive application of the law but when it comes to the constitution if something is unconstitutional, it is unconstitutional compared to the provisions of the Constitution, which remain constant. It hasn't changed. So from the beginning of that thing, that law, that decision, that act or omission, measured against the Constitution, it is inconsistent and therefore unconstitutional. So it will always be from the birth of that thing or mm -hmm. from the inception of that thing. So it meant that if the law that allowed you to use NHIS cards to register was unconstitutional, then null and void, then nothing could be founded on it. So anything like a voter ID card um, that you got from the use 
of the NHIS card, which the law allowed you to do, would also be null and void. Um, and so uh, we wanted to know from the Electoral Commission what steps they were taking in view of that decision. The Electoral Commission wrote back to my clients uh, saying that as far as they were concerned, there was no problem with the voters register and there was nothing to do. Uh, we were instructed to write again to the Electoral Commission inquiring about the number of people who use the NHIS card to register and um, uh, again um, whether they had they could identify those people and uh, what they intended to do about it. That letter received no reply. Uh, meanwhile the 2014 il uh, uh, limited registration exercise took place and in keeping with the court's judgment the NHIS card was not used as one of the documents that you could use to establish qualification. Um, the following the second letter that we had written in March of 2015 <coughs> uh, inquiring about the number of NHIS users the number of uh, uh, whether they could identify who they were and so on and we didn't get a reply our clients instructed us to go to court uh, because in their view the register contained the names of people who had not established qualification to register under article 42 which says you must be Ghanaian 18 years of age and above and of sound mind. So we filed a writ uh, in December of 2015. In fact, specifically on December 22nd, 2015. On December 31st, the Justice Crab Committee that had been set up by the Electoral Commission to look into these <coughs> issues of the voting register, following a petition submitted by the New Patriotic Party, came out with their report. When we read the report, it substantially confirmed the position of my clients. Um, and of course, the Electoral Commission had also declared that it was, it accepted the report and had adopted it and even posted it on their website. At around the same time, the Electoral Commission had also now responded to the petition that the, the New Patriotic Party had submitted to them, alleging various issues with the register, including the use of the NHIS card, mm -hmm. the presence of minors <coughs> and uh, <coughs> foreigners who they had identified in some audits that they had undertaken in respect of the Togolese and so on. They finally got a, a response. And that response to made some uh, uh, germane or relevant admissions about the uh, use of the NHIS card. One of the things that they also said was that they intended to use the, the challenge mechanisms under the law in order to clean the register of those who use the NHIS card to register and also to give them an opportunity to be able to uh, mm -hmm. register or, uh, again or to, to stay on the, on, the, on the register. So in view of all of those, we thought that it was critical that the court be apprised of these two documents and what they contain. So we withdrew the, the, the writ filed in December 2015 and in February we filed another uh, writ because to amend would have just made the document too bulky. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in that document, we sought um, uh, declarations and certain, certain reliefs. First, that the, uh, when the Constitution under Article 45A mandates the Electoral Commission to compile the register of voters, the register of voters and not a register of voters is referable to Article 42 which says that if you're a Ghanaian, 18 years of age and above and of sound mind, you are entitled to, be, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to have your name on the register of voters. Mm -hmm. So that is the register they're talking about. And therefore, it can't be just any register. It has to be a register that conforms to the Constitution. But we, here we are, we had people who were not qualified and even dead people on the register. And according to the Justice Crabb report, Having almost 600,000 dead people on the register was a recipe for chaos. In fact, they, what they said was that it was an intolerable margin. One, because nobody had ever won a presidential election with that number of voters. And two, more critically, because with that number of people on the register, it made the manipulation of election results quite possible and quite real. And therefore, it was not a good thing. The Justice Crab report had also um, made the point that between no new register and keeping the old bloated register, which they said the EC had no viable method of identifying ineligible people and even removing the names of dead persons. There was a middle ground 
that they thought could be effective, which they mm -hmm. called the record validation process, which mm -hmm. allowed everybody who was registered to come to their polling stations, be uh, uh, verified that they're in the system, and then establish their qualification to remain. One of the reasons why uh, that was uh, 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 being advocated by the committee was that the challenge, exhibition and challenge mechanism was fraught with difficulties. One, they felt it was not effective and efficient. Secondly, they thought it was too confrontational because it required a third party to say, Mr. Kwesi Pratt is not a Ghanaian, or he used a document that doesn't qualify him, so he must be taken off. It also, uh, I think, referred to the low turnout uh, of, on, at the exhibitions in, par in the past and thought that that was not a very solid way of uh, cleaning the register. So we thought that that was an excellent method by which the register could be cleaned out. And in fact, it was a cheaper way than coming up with a whole new uh, a register. It had been used in other jurisdictions like the UK in Nigeria. And so uh, the second relief that we asked for was a declaration that to the extent that there were people who were not qualified in the register, it didn't make the register reasonably accurate or credible, and therefore it was inconsistent with the Constitution. Again, a declaration that the presence of deceased persons on the register didn't make the register reasonably accurate or credible, and therefore inconsistent with the Constitution. And therefore, an order doing one of two things, setting aside the register, and compelling the EC to compile a new one, or in the alternative, adopting the record validation process, mm -hmm. and uh, which would end up um, deleting names of people who could not establish qualification to remain, uh, or at, at least um, um, uh, at, that, at that point. Now, talking about qualification, just, just isn't it possible that those who use the NHIS cards you know, as proof of nationality, could be qualified to register. Yes, yes, it is true that, in fact, that's what I just said, that in our view, probably the majority of persons who use the NHIS card to register are Ghanaians, mm -hmm. except that they haven't, you see, the, the Constitution says that in order for you to register, you must show that you are a Ghanaian. Yeah. Yes. So. Being a Ghanaian alone is not enough. You must establish that you are a Ghanaian. Yeah. And because the use of the NHIS card didn't establish that you are a Ghanaian, you were not qualified to be on the register. That is the that is the. But the in threshold. the circumstances, uh, with the coming into effect of CI 72, persons who wanted to register knew that they were allowed to use the NHIS card. Yes. So they were not doing something wrong. No. Yes. It, it, it is not about wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. We have to be clear about that. Yes. It is about compliance with the constitutional requirements. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. Let's say that um, Parliament passes a law which criminalizes some activity. And the, um, uh, the Attorney General prosecutes you in good faith on the basis of that law. Mm -hmm. And you are convicted. Ten years in prison. Then your lawyers challenge that law in terms of its constitutionality. Sometimes these cases can take a while. By the time it actually is heard by the Supreme Court, maybe you've been in prison for two years. Then the Supreme Court says that that law is unconstitutional. It cannot be possible. It is not legally reasonable or constitutionally acceptable for the Attorney General to say that at the time that you were convicted, the law was a credible law Mm -hmm. and I acted in good faith without malice mm -hmm. and you were convicted so spend you've been there two years you've got eight more years <laughs> no reasonable court will accept that if it is unconstitutional it doesn't matter the good faith of the Attorney General and the fact that he has done nothing wrong it is the fact that it is inconsistent with the Constitution and it cannot stand it is void anything that you put on something that is void cannot stand there's an old uh, uh, case, um, I think, uh, uh, McFoy versus USC, uh, Lord Denning, in which was famously quoted by Kufuado uh, in, in a Ghanaian uh, uh, mm -hmm. case, which says that you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand. It will crumble. 
And that is exactly what it is. Once this constitution, the Supreme Court says that, look, this law, this decision that you did, this law that you passed, this failure to act is unconstitutional. And therefore, anything that's founded on it is null and void. So that is the position that we have. It is not that the people who, in good faith, used the NHIS card to register did something wrong. No. But we're a society that is founded on the rule of law. And the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And nothing that is inconsistent with the Constitution can stand. So unfortunately, we cannot say that because those persons acted in good faith and they acted under a law that at the time had not been declared unconstitutional, it is fine. No. The issue of constitutionality or not has nothing to do with the point of declaration. Mm -hmm. It is not that it is constitutional until it is declared unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. It is always unconstitutional. Yes. Okay, I agree. Yes. But in this case, as opposed to the case that you made reference to, the, the victims uh, had nothing to do with the passage of the law and its interpretation. Mm -hmm. You understand? Those who went and registered with the NHIS cards were not involved uh, in making the law CI-72. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to act lawfully. And at the time, it appeared that it was lawful so to act. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. No, but in the, in the other case too, the mm -hmm. criminal had nothing, the, uh, sorry, the convict had nothing to do with the passage of the law. Mm -hmm. He uh, probably didn't even know about the law, was mm -hmm. going about what he thought was lawful activity, mm -hmm. caught by the law. The law is now declared unconstitutional. And the Attorney General wants to say that, well, sorry, but at the time that we, we uh, uh, convicted you, the law was fine. And so we can't uh, go back. No. It is void ab initio. The, the involvement or not mm -hmm. of the persons who used it to register is immaterial in constitutional analysis. Mm -hmm. it, it cannot be the position, and it is not the position, that it is only when something is declared unconstitutional that it becomes unconstitutional. It is only from that time going, and that everything else is OK. It is saved, because at the time it was not, no. If you do that, constitutions can never survive. It can never live. The constitution is always the constitution. It is constant. That one is there. That is the benchmark. So it doesn't matter if it is 10 years afterwards that it is declared unconstitutional. Once it is declared unconstitutional, null and void, it is ab initio. It is from the beginning, the inception. And unfortunately, and you see, because of the equity argument you're raising is why the court in the second case is saying that, well, you can't just get rid of them. You have to give them an opportunity. Uh, to be heard, you have to give them an opportunity to register lawfully, and that but, but, solves but the see, problem. In the case that you, you, you referred to, if the court decided that the prison term should be quashed, the court will be providing reliefs to the victim, the person in jail who has committed no offence. Mm -hmm. You understand? In the in the second case, the court will be punishing the victim. No, because he has, the court has first of all said that they must be given, because it was not their fault. No, must I, be I, given want, I want us to come to that later. Okay. You understand? Fair, fair On the face of it, that what is unconstitutional is always unconstitutional, ab initio, and yes. so on, as, as you say. Yes. We ought to be looking at the court decision and how it affects the victim. Yes. The court decision, in my view, should always provide relief for the victim. Yes. But you see, in this case, mm -hmm. Um, we, ha we are contriving a victim, mm -hmm. see? Mm -hmm. We are contriving a victim. Mm -hmm. And the extent of the victimization is not even known. Because as long as we're not saying, for example, that the votes cast by these people should be annulled, that mm -hmm. is something you cannot do. Mm -hmm. But they cannot continue to maintain an illegal status. They, they cannot. No court can sanction that. It is true that they suffer some liability in the sense that they now have to go and register again. Well, I'm sorry. Those are part of being in a civilized society, part the, of your the law civic, governed society. a law-governed society. You simply cannot. I mean, it's like, remember when we were doing the biometric? Mm -hmm. Some of us had our voter ID cards. Suddenly, they passed a law that says, you know, all those voter ID cards don't work. We all have to go and do biometric now. Mm -hmm. Some people had traveled. Some people were ill. And so they didn't have a, an opportunity to do the biometric. They thereby lost the right that they had acquired to vote in 2000, 2004, 2008. Unfortunately, these are some of the incidents 
of, 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 of working in a law-governed society. And I would say that the objective, the imperative, the constitutional imperative of having valid elections, you know, one of the, the foundations of our constitution mm -hmm. is the principle of one person, one vote, universal adult suffrage. It mm -hmm. is key to our constitutional enterprise. It is part of the preamble right there. And when you don't have a credible register, you probably will not have a, a, a credible election. And the principle of one man, one vote is lost. This is what Justice Crabbe's committee was talking about, that if you have 600,000 people, knowing our system, for example, the manipulation is there. You cancel out one man, one vote. And that is a problem. The national interest, the compelling national interest, is to be able to have credible elections. It's to be able to have a credible register in order to have credible elections. If one of the, 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 the casualties or the incidents of doing that is that certain people may have to re-register I don't think that's a problem. You know when you do constitutional analysis, even for human rights, personal human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and so on, they're subject to certain laws which may be in the compelling national interest, such that the curtailment of some of those rights is seen as tolerable in the larger interest. Now, if we're going to say that we do nothing about these uh, NHIS registrants, then we're also going to say that we don't mind having a whole host of foreigners uh, uh, on the register. In two, 2011 alone, during the special NHIS registration exercise, they registered over 2 million people. As you know, to register with NHIS, you have to be an adult because the children were subsumed under your registration. Mm -hmm. So 18 years and above. So that it means that all of these 2 million people were where we're able to register in terms of the voters, uh, voters register. Could have registered. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They were eligible to register. Yeah. Uh, do, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we're saying, and of course, we, we, I'm always reminded of the Attorney General's statement in court mm -hmm. in, his, in his submissions that mm -hmm. the, potent, the majority, we registered 14 million people. If you're talking about a majority, even if you're charitable, that's 7 million people. And the truth is that he's right or she's right because it was the most widely accessible card. The, the job of registering people for NHIS was so s successful that a lot of people had those cards. So it was the easiest thing for people to use, you see. But it does not take away from the fact that they are maintaining an unconstitutional illegal status. And to paint them as victims who must get relief would be to then say they should remain. That is inconsistent with the core values of our constitution. It is inconsistent with the basic law and the provisions relating to the voters' register. We are in conversation with Nana Asante Bebieto, a lawyer for the plaintiffs in the Abu Ramadan and one other case. And we are looking at the matter before the court, its merits and so on. Now, sir, is there an empirical basis for the claim? that the vast majority of people registered with the NHIS card? If there is, I'm not aware. Um, but um, as, I, as I said, the, the arguments proffered by the Attorney General in the first Abu Ramadan case, to me, were convincing because um, the Attorney General laid out a basis for that claim. Apart from the fact that being the principal legal advisor to government, the Attorney General would be in a position to know um, I think that um, the arguments or, or that they put across in terms of the accessibility of the card, uh, the fact that it was easy to, uh, uh, to, 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 to get, um, and the fact that the, they knew of the distribution of the, uh, 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 the, the card across the, across the country and they would have access to the data in terms of the National Health Insurance uh, Authority uh, and how many people had used it to register and they could reasonably uh, make conjecture. the deduction. They could conjecture. Yeah. Um, but I cannot say if they were conjecturing or if they had uh, some empirical data upon which they relied. But those were sworn statements uh, in court and I have no reason to doubt the Attorney General. Yeah, you may not, but others may have good reason to sure. doubt the Attorney sure. General. Yeah, sure. In which case, that claim that the vast majority of people register with the NHIS card may not be that strong. Without an empirical basis, it may not be that strong. Well, I mean, it, this is true, um, uh, but it doesn't take away 
from the fact that um, even if it's not the vast majority, but it's a significant minority or what have you, they are not supposed to be on the register. The, 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 the point is that they cannot remain on the register at all. Um, you, it may not be, a, for example, let's say 100,000 people use the, use the NHIS card to register. It may not be a basis for saying that it renders the whole register suspect, but it's the basis for saying that they do not belong there and therefore they should be removed and given an opportunity to register lawfully. So that is the, that is the distinction. It, it may not re render the whole register uh, a, a bad case, but certainly they do not belong there under the Constitution, and we have to comply with the Constitution. Isn't it the case that what we can actually say is that they didn't have sufficient proof of nationality and leave it there? Not having sufficient proof of nationality is not the same as not being qualified to register. The only way that we know that you're qualified to register is to establish your qualification with proof. Yeah. So if you have not established qualification, again, let's be very clear. We're not saying these people are not Ghanaians. They may right. very well be Ghanaians mm -hmm. and, in, and 18 years of age and above and therefore uh, qualified as long mm -hmm. as assuming they have of sound mind. But that is not the basis upon which you get on the register. The constitution says that you must establish you must be Ghanaian. Yes. Yeah. So but I'm saying so that if they you could have so, been Ghanaian. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. But but if you haven't done so, you have no right to be on the register. That's the difference. Okay. Now let's move to the issue of uh, dead people mm -hmm. whose names appeared on the register. What is the humbug with that? What is the problem with that? Right. If I understand, uh, for example, the, the the crab committee correctly. Um, and if we cast our minds back to some of the issues that popped up in the election petition case, one can manipulate election results simply because they've got room to do so. Mm -hmm. There are names that, you know, and, and um, where we're talking about transposition of figures, for example, if you go to a polling station and there are 100 people on the polling station register, 30 of whom are dead. So in reality, only 70 can potentially vote. Maybe, let's give it a high turnout. Maybe 60 of them show up. If you want to be able to manipulate the figures, because you've got 30 names on the register who don't show up, you've got 30, 30 votes to play with. But if those 30 names are not there, you don't have that opportunity. It is not about people voting in their names, although that can also happen. But it's about the manipulation of figures because there's room to do so. If I understand Justice Crabb's committee correctly, that is what they were saying. And if I cast my mind back to some of the big issues that happened in the election petition case about the number of ballots that are issued, ballots that are issued, for example, you see, go to the number of people at the polling station. So if you issue a ballot book of 1,000 uh, ballots, when you only need to issue 800 because there is 700 people plus 10% extra. But, but because you have dead people, you've gone and, uh, wh which, which says there's 900, you've actually gone and now put 1,000. It gives room to manipulate the ballot at that polling station because you've got the means. So it doesn't tighten up. It, it makes, it makes the, uh, the, the ballot administration on voting day, for example, very, very, very lax. And that is where the danger is. Isn't this at the theoretical con, you know, level of conjecturing the problem that you raised? Isn't it at the theoretical level of conjecturing? No, not at all. Is, there, is there any hard evidence that that has happened? That people have used uh, dead people? Dead, the no, numbers of dead people know. to manipulate we elections. Don't know, we yeah. don't know that they've used the numbers of dead people, but That's we do know that they've used excess numbers. Mm at the polling station to be able to do that. That was some of the, the evidence that came out in the, in the election petition case. Mm -hmm. They may have been alive, I don't know. But certainly, excess numbers at a polling station have been uh, used to manipulate well, the alleged. results. Alleged. Well, alleged, well, you know, which is um, different um, from being used. Yeah. And um, 
uh, I'm, I'm convinced by the analysis that that, that, that um, occurred. Again, even if it's conjecture, because some of the, the safeguards that we try to put in place for elections to be successful and credible are all based on conjecture, if we're going to look at sure. it that way. Sure. The possibilities, they're mm -hmm. all based on the possibilities. So because of that, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Because of that, let's do this. Um, I don't think in the past, for example, uh, we had actually um, gotten hard evidence proven in a court, for example, that people were doing multiple thumbprinting of ballots mm -hmm. at elections. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not aware of a case in which that was established. But we came up with biometric registration and verification to avoid precisely that, somebody doing multiple thumbprinting and multiple voting and so on. So it, it, we, I don't think we need to necessarily establish with hard evidence that this is uh, something that has occurred. If it has the potential to occur and it is a credible po uh, potential, then we ought to do something about it. And I think the experts themselves, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the members of the CRAB committee comprise very serious uh, experts in statistics, in, in IT, and, uh, and, and what have you, and a former electoral commissioner and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think they ought to have a fair sense of some of the things that could happen and some of the things that we need to guard against. But we also came up with biometric voting yeah. in order to deal with the situation where dead names could be used in the voting process. Because to vote, you need your biometric details. Yes. And dead people carry away their biometric details. Yes. Now, if you recall, one of, do you, you see, one of the, 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 the things that came up in the election petition is that when there were allegations of overvoting, mm -hmm. the easiest way, Kwesi, to debunk that allegation is to bring the biometric machine. Sure. Just show us how many people went through sure. the machine. Mm -hmm. the easiest. Easy. Not one biometric machine was brought into court. Why? Not one. Why? You should ask them. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm the electoral commission, Kwesi, yeah. and I know that my figures are correct, mm -hmm. and that only the people who went through the machine and voted are the people who are captured on the pink sheet, that is the first thing I would have done. Okay? So, it seems to me, and you also remember, by the way, that at some point, I think on the second day, this whole biometric thing was thrown to the dogs. And people were allowed to vote without verification because the machines were breaking down and, you know, blah, 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 what have you. I personally believe that that laxity, that leeway, allowed a lot of things to happen that probably... But that accounted for 1% of votes. Of what? Votes. I mean, that leeway accounted for 1% of votes. The malfunction yeah. actually affected 1% of votes. But how do we know that? The Electoral Commission says so. And how does the Electoral Commission say so? Because you see, if the Electoral Commission says so, it's credible, the only way they can do so it's is to, bring to have the, the by bring the machines. <laughs> because at that point, there's a point at which the machine breaks down and you go for manual. Mm -hmm. So you know the number. At the end of the day, you know the total. Take out the manual from the machine and you know the percentage. Exactly. They never brought the machines. Because well, they were not allowed to bring the machines. No, they could have. It was up to them. Now, I understand that the court decided no, that... No, 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 no. Not true. Because not I true. knew that the defendants insisted on bringing the Do you know what they tried to do? No. If you recall, they tried to bring... They brought one printout mm -hmm. from the machines. Mm -hmm. It's part of the record. They brought mm -hmm. a printout. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, one of the things that the machine did, or was supposed to be able to do, was to have a counter. So it counts everybody that goes through the machine. So at the end of the day, while your agent is sitting there with his tally form, mm -hmm. he can check and see that I tallied 600 people. Let's see what the machine printout says. Mm -hmm. 600 people, no, no problem. trouble. And guess what? My information is that the machines were programmed. Just, I think yesterday, you, was it yesterday you were on, uh, no, two days ago, you were on Kokroko. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. came up about the machines shutting off. So yeah. the students who were in the queue, you were arguing that once you were in the queue, yeah, yeah. I remember, they said yes. that the machine shut yeah. off. Yes. Well, let me tell you. Guess what? In 2012, my information is that the machines sh uh, reverted to zero automatically 48 hours after the election. 
And that may account for the reason why the EC ne was never able to produce them. But if that is true, why would anybody do that? I don't know. Because the records because, need because, to be kept. Because, because, because I would have thought mm -hmm. that the whole point of having the counter mm -hmm. is to be able to tell us at any point in time. Now, somebody suggested to me that perhaps the reason was because if there was a runoff, the machines, but I said, but then you can set it to zero manually. Exactly. It, it doesn't have to go automatically. Exactly. But anyway, for all of these reasons, to me, um, we need to be as tight as we can on the numbers so that the ballot papers that are given to each polling station are reasonably accurate, so that there is no extra ballot papers, there's no extra accounting, and so on, because there just happen to be names there. And whether they show up or not, they can be used. It is a serious, I think, a serious uh, issue that we must guard against. Now, what were the reliefs that your clients sought, which were granted? Were any of their reliefs granted? Yes, they were granted in part. In part? In part, yes. Um, we asked for a declaration that the presence of the names of unqualified persons, that is, people who we were referring to, I mean, the whole case was about NHIs and deceased persons, but for unqualified, you can also include minors, for example. That the, the presence of the names of unqualified persons on the register did not make the register reasonably accurate and credible, and therefore inconsistent with the Constitution uh, uh, null and void. The court granted it in part and said that the presence of unqualified persons on the register did not make it reasonably accurate or credible and stopped there. They didn't go to the extent of saying it was unconstitutional, null and void. Because to say so would mean that the whole register was gone. And in the judgment, if you read the judgment, the court made the point that because they didn't know the exact number of people that had used the, 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 the NHIS card to register, they didn't know the extent of the taint. And therefore, it was difficult for them to say that it was unconstitutional. But what they can say is that their presence makes it not reasonably accurate or credible, and something must be done about it. And that is why they gave the relief that they, their names must be removed. Same thing with the dead uh, persons, that to the extent that they were on there. And in, in this case, the court actually went a bit further and said that they thought that the dead persons, even the numbers that we used, which was from the Crab Report, was not significant. I disagree with that, but they said it wasn't significant, 600,000 people, and therefore they couldn't go ahead to say it was unconstitutional. And then they denied us the relief to uh, set aside the register and compile a new one, and the relief to, obviously because if they, can't, if they haven't said it's unconstitutional, they can't set it aside, mm -hmm. and the relief on the validation because they said there was no uh, legal uh, mechanism for putting into effect the validation. We agree with that, um, except to say that our argument was not that by law the EC was mandated to do validation. Our argument was that the decision not to do the validation was unreasonable under Article 296 and Article 23, and that no reasonable uh, or rational body as the EC in that situation would choose not to do it. And the basis of that was that the, their own committee that they had established had said that a good middle ground to take to clean the register was validation. On the face of it, and I think even the court said that, look, um, it, 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 no matter how good the validation process may be, there is no law backing it. And I think any reasonable person, in my view, in my humble view, who looks at the process of validation will see that it's a credible process. And that, in fact, if we, if we made it part of our law, where every election year, everybody needed to be validated so you can participate in the election, it would always maintain, help maintain a credible register. In the UK, it's done every October. It's called the, the canvassing. In, the, in Nigeria, uh, it was used successfully to clean the register and have a, as, as credible uh, a, a register as possible to do the election, which has been hailed by many as, as a good one. So our argument was that if faced with the choice of doing nothing, or do using the challenge process, which will not rid the register of those persons. It simply will not. That challenge exhibition process cannot, and I think we should be very clear about that, do what is needed to be done. And having the option of the validation, it was a bad decision, an unreasonable one. 
the court didn't agree with that. In fact, the court didn't really address that point that well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I think it's, it was satisfied that, look, there's no law backing it, and so we can't say they should go ahead and do it. Uh, so those were the reliefs that we asked okay. for, and those are the reliefs that were granted. And then the court went ahead based on those reliefs to give the consequential orders. We were happy with the consequential orders because that was why we went to court in the first place, to ensure that unqualified persons were not in the register. The program which is sponsored by Gassan, the nation's builder, and we are particularly privileged to be having this conversation with Nana Asante Bedieto. Now, sir, the court decided that we should clean the register. What did the court prescribe as the process for cleaning the register? What is to be removed from the register? Thank you. Um, the court said that the name, the, 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 the register should be cleaned up to delete so that it conforms to the 1992 constitution. So what does the 1992 constitution say? It says that you must be a Ghanaian, 18 years of age and above, and of sound mind. Now, obviously, if you are dead, you can't be of sound mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. so, so that category is clear. If you're not established that you're a Ghanaian, which is the NHIS people, that is also clear. And if you, have not, you did not establish that you were 18, that is also clear. So those categories of pe persons, the court is saying, go and delete their names. The process, which I think a lot of fetish is being made out of, is a simple process. Go and delete. It is not a term of art. It is to go and delete. We must also remember that during the proceedings, um, the court asked the Electoral Commission, in fact, in, in a, quite an extraordinary way, because the, the, the lawyer, my, my good friend Thaddeus Sorry, was asked whether the EC had a database and whether they could identify which percentage of persons used the NHIS card or passport or driving license or national ID. And he responded that on his feet he could not know. He was given leave by the court to consult the chairman, chairperson of the Electoral Commission who was in court with the deputy chairperson for operations. So he stepped away from the bar and consulted with them. And they said that, yes, they have a database. If you look in the database, you can't tell who used what to register. But if you go to the source documents, the Form 1A, you mm -hmm. could do that. Mm -hmm. So, And this was recorded by the Chief Justice as part of the record. So one can only uh, uh, imagine that one of the bases for the court's order. And you know, the judgment of the Supreme Court is law. And all law is deemed to be reasonable. And the reasonable basis for that is that the first defender, the Electoral Commission, had informed the court that they could identify these people. So well, if you can identify them, then go and delete their names. And, but because of the equity argument that Kwesi you were raising, when you delete their names, because they are not properly registered, mm -hmm. give them a chance to re-register using lawful means. That is all the judgment says. Now, in the case of dead people, is it reasonable to assume that there would always be dead people on the register? I think so, because on the day of election, people die who may have been registered to vote, yes. Or well, even people may die that you cannot tell that they are dead. Yes. Because I mean, of the system of registering deaths and, and deaths, and yes. so on. Yes. So there would always be dead people on the register. This is true, yes. So what would make the register acceptable with regards to dead people? What would make it acceptable? Is it when we have deleted a certain number? What is it that would make the register acceptable in relation to dead people? I think in questions like this, it is dangerous to try to look for absolutes. And that's why we always talk about reasonable. Um, the Justice Crab Committee found that 600,000 dead people uh, uh, in fact, to be more accurate, it was 548,000 or so dead people. How did they even come to that conclusion? They, 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 they did statistical analysis. Okay. It's in their report, yes. Okay. And of course, they had a former government statistician. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they did okay. the calculations, yes. Yeah. And that is what insurance companies and actuarials use anyway to determine okay. all these things. So it's, it's valid. Um, now, they're saying that that margin, again, they used the, the, the phrase... Uh, uh, is intolerable. So, like you're saying, what would be tolerable would be what is be reasonable. 
Sitting here, I, I cannot say what it is, but certainly we know what is not tolerable and what is uh, dangerous, uh, as, as, as the Crab Committee uh, fully recognized. Um, we can only have a system where we continuously, uh, because that's the job, the, 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 the Electoral Commission cannot simply be around and wake up only uh, in the four years, every four years, or every time they have to do district assembly elections. But we, we should have a system by which there are proper linkages, perhaps through a much more established national ID system or what have you, uh, where we can consistently weed out these names. As of now, the Electoral Commission has a proposal of what it's going to do about dead people. Uh, it's going to contact unit committees, district assemblies, government institutions, other public institutions that will be able to tell them who has passed on. They're going to rely on the exhibition uh, mechanism in order to... But couldn't that be abused? I mean, if I'm serving on a unit committee, and I know that X, Y, Z belong to a certain political party, I could get their names out. Yes, but you could do that only with proof. You would have to okay. show okay. that they are indeed deceased. Death certificate, you know, they have a record. The unit committees, because they have a record, they record people who are dead. You can't go and doctor the record. Okay. You would have to produce maybe an obituary, a poster, something that shows that, in fact, they're dead. Uh, but once you find out they're dead, you must delete their names. Mm -hmm. And that is what the court is saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the, 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 these are the issues that I think give rise to the efficacy of the validation process that the Crab Committee was talking about and that the plaintiffs were hoping the court would, would, um, would ask the EC to adopt. Because that one, you don't have to go looking for anyone. You don't have to comb through millions of Form 1As Forms 1A to find out who used an NHIS card to register mm -hmm. or go through obituaries or the debt registry or go through government institutions. We are going to have to take a lot of time to, to do this. Um, you simply have a process where you set aside a period, mm -hmm. the same way we set aside the period for people to come and register when we're doing biometric, that all those who want to remain on the register, because remember, registering is voluntary. It's not, it's not as they say in Ghana, by force. Mm -hmm. And voting is not <laughs> compulsory either. So if you want to remain on the register and cast your vote, within this period, we've opened the, the registration centers, uh, the, the polling stations. Come, establish or verify that you're in the system, and then establish that you qualify to remain in the system. Mm -hmm. Those who are genuine Ghanaians who use the NHIS card to register will be able to stay on the register. Mm -hmm. Those who are not, because they don't have the means any longer, because we do not longer, no longer accept the NHIS card, will not be able to. Mm -hmm. If you're genuinely a Ghanaian, and now you know CI-91 says that even the guarantee, you have to be a parent, a sibling, some a, a, a legal guardian, some family member to be able to show that, you, yes, Kwesi Pratt is a Ghanaian, he's my nephew, or he's my son, or he's my, my wife, or my, or my husband, or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that he's 18 uh, years of age and above. In fact, in our meeting with the EC, they had suggested that they wanted to introduce um, weighing cards and baptismal certificates which show your age. Mm -hmm. So that even when you're guaranteeing for someone, uh, you would require that they establish their age as well. Weighing card? <laughs> yeah, apparently weighing cards have your date of birth. Yeah, but my weighing card. Yeah, I know. I mean, but it wasn't, that was, not, something the, years that was ago. not the only one. They mentioned a few other documents. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure if that's what they're doing, but they mentioned that. All in a bid to be able to establish uh, that you are a uh, Ghanaian. So that process would have, in the end, said that, look, if you do not show up within the three-week period, we will not include you on the list to vote in uh, mm -hmm. November, or we will strike your name off. The good news is that even when that happens, you are not foreclosed because CI 91 now has what is known as continuous registration. Mm -hmm. And the political parties and the EC simply need to come out with the modalities. Something like perhaps they will set aside a week every month where, or every quarter where you would go and be able to register. So that once you're turning 18, you know mm -hmm. that every month, four days in a month, the, the offices are open and also have safeguards because in those four days, all polling agents or registration agents of political parties will be there to ensure that fraud is not committed and so on. Simple. So even if you're taking off, it's not the end of the world. As long as you register within, uh, before 60 days uh, of the election, you should be able to vote. But at least we then begin to maintain a credible register. 
And that is what I find appealing about the validation process. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's worked elsewhere very well. Mm. Yeah, it worked elsewhere very well. I mean, we keep making references to Nigeria. I had the privilege of uh, interviewing Professor Jekka. Jekka. I'm just wondering whether what they did in Nigeria will pass here. For example, Professor Jega says that, uh, well, we looked at people and we decided that they were underage and we just deleted their names. Or that we saw names that were strange, you know, like Queen Elizabeth I and so on. <laughs> Would that pass here? I, I don't think, I, 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 without trying to offend our Nigerian brothers and sisters, I think we're a bit more sophisticated than that. And I don't think that would pass here. The important point about the Nigerian exercise was that people who had already registered needed to come and justify their inclusion. That is the simple thing. Not the knitted gritty of what they did, but the, the principle that you're already registered, but in order to participate in the upcoming election, you need to justify your inclusion. The methods by which we, do, we would do that here would not include what you are saying, <laughs> Professor Jega say, is saying they did. We would obviously require, because the law would um, require that you come to validate with the, the traditional forms mm. of ID uh, or mm. qualification mm. documents that are in, the, are in the law, the passport, the driving license, the national ID, mm -hmm. a, a non-biometric voter ID card that is pre-biometric voter ID card, mm. and so on. And, or if you don't have those, then perhaps we could say, just as we guarantee to register a new, we could have already validated guarantors. Once they've been validated, they can now also validate Mm. Uh, somebody or, or guarantee somebody's validation. The reason why that is also important is that you know people are talking about all those people who got their registrations through validations, uh, uh, sorry, guarantees by people who used NHIS cards to register. Yeah. The validation process cures all of that mm. Mm. because it simply requires all of us who are registered to show up at the polling station and demonstrate that we belong on the register. The first that we want to be on the register and we belong on the register. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so very, much. Very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Well, viewers, this has been a conversation on hot issues, which is sponsored by Gassam, the nation's builder. And we've been talking to Nana Asanti Bedietu, and I'm sure that uh, you have no doubts about his competence. You listened to him, you heard him, you, you, you evaluated the argument and so on. As I always say, the best is on TV3. Best in news, best in entertainment, best in everything. Please stay with us until we meet again next week. It's bye-bye from all of us.